Today on Electric City Television's Roundtable Discussions, we'll be speaking with Richard Huck. Richard is an artist and educator. He's a longtime board member of AFA and a signature member of the Color Pencil Society of America. We'll be taking a look at some of his photorealistic color pencil drawings. Welcome to another episode of Electric City Television's Roundtable Discussions. I'm your host, Travis Prince, and today our guest is Richard Huck. Rich, it's nice to have you with us. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. So right off the bat, uh, I want to let our viewers know as much about you as, as they can. So start off with some of your um, earliest art education and, and uh, oh my gosh. where you went to school at. Oh my gosh. I um, always wanted to be an artist. Ever since I was a little kid, that's, I started drawing. I, I can remember being in kindergarten and drawing this house that had a door that opened. I cut it so the door would open. This is kindergarten. Mm. And I had a little bunny standing on two legs, like a human, but a bunny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, my parents encouraged me, and it was in the, in the 50s. So, you know, people were not pushing me to have a trade or do this, do that. It was, art was always the focus. Mm. So I was very, very fortunate in that regard. So all through high school, all through uh, grade school, middle school, high school, I wanted to be in the arts. And it changed uh, the avenue of which I wanted to, to pursue in the arts. But uh, I initially wanted to be a car designer. Hmm. You know, through, you know, when you're in middle school, you, you know, you like cars. In high school, you like cars. and. So I started designing them. Your, your family was very supportive of you as an artist from a young age. Very. Uh, do you think that is what actually helped you get to the point where you're at now? Uh, with that extra encouragement, that extra support from like your internal sources? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so. You know, the constant encouragement of your parents just, you know, they were happy to see me sitting and drawing and, and so on. And that's what I did. And that's, that's a thing that I always say, too. I think that all humans are, we're just artists from nature. It's, it's a natural tendency for us to want to create a mark. If you give a child a crayon or a marker or a color pencil, they're going to mark and, and try to uh, leave something on a paper. And I think that some of us continue to make those marks throughout our life and enjoy it and have fun with it. And some of us just uh, seem not to enjoy marking as much. And like you said, you've always been drawing ever since you can remember as a child. So uh, later on in, in your uh, high school and college career, what were some of your main impressions coming from and your main inspirations outside of just your, your family support? Oh, they got me art lessons when I was young. And I found out later on that the teacher who actually designed the crown, uh, crown prince, I for, now I forget now, but um, the crown jewels for the king and queen of Belgium. Oh, wow. I know, it's like, wow. And that, to me, she was this crazy cat woman from Europe because <laughs> wow. there had to be three dozen cats walking around, you know, and I was, <laughs> I was like eight, you know, so I was, I was, the environment itself was very exciting to me. Mm. And uh, I had a little bit of trouble focusing on exactly what she wanted me to do, which was basically just copy a photograph or um, a painting of some kind. So I learned a lot of copying back then, which I really took a while to get out of. But uh, outside of that, uh, you know, artists, I mean, I grew up right outside of New York City, so I was always going into the museums. You know, anytime we had a school field trip, where'd we go? New York. New York. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Metropolitan was always my favorite. Of course, I got lost in there, I don't know how many times. <laughs> Even last week. Okay, not last week. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just seeing all the masters and, and all the different types of artwork that was there, and I was very into... Norman Rockwell back in, in the day, and a lot of illustrators. Mm -hmm. and I, after that uh, idea of being a car designer, I decided illustration was really more my avenue. 
and they influenced me greatly. So, so you had a, a really eclectic uh, experience as a, as a child to in, interpret all these different masters and artists into your own artwork and your own styles. Correct. That's so, true. Um, even, even when I look at your art, because, um, <clears throat> and I'm saying this in honesty, that you are probably one of my favorite artists. <laughs> um, so I, I noticed your, your style is, is very uh, detailed and it's, it's, uh, it, it leads a way to um, not exactly surrealism, but um, the realist movement where it's not as romanticized as um, some of the French Renaissance artists, it's more real and more more kind of gritty a little bit. That that stems a lot from the illustrators, mm. you know. And I was like like I said, I was very influenced by what they were doing, and and I was very uh, excited about trying to emulate not just so much their style. Not that I can do a Norman Rockwell, but I like the skill that was involved, but then, you know, I'd, then I'd go to the museums and I'd see these gigantic Mark Rothko's and Franz Klein's and I'm thinking, how'd they do that, mm -hmm. you know? And I just didn't understand them then. I was too young and I didn't understand how art progressed to where it, to where it was then and where it is now. But I've always been a very skilled oriented person. Um, when I got out of High school, I went to college, and about halfway through my college career, I decided that they revamped the curriculum so that I would be graduating with just a Bachelor of Arts in Art. And I thought, okay, that's not like illustration or commercial art or anything like that. It was just art. And I thought, what can I do with that? So I switched over to education to be a little bit more well-rounded in the marketplace. And I never liked, in high school and even in college, I never really liked talking in front of people. <laughs> Imagine so that. what do I do? I become a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent 40 years doing just exactly what I never thought I would be doing. Wow, 40 years as, 40. as an educator. As an educator. And I, you I, taught I, art? I taught art. I loved it. Wow. Absolutely loved it. What was, what was uh, some of your best experiences as an art educator? Oh my gosh, there's far too many. I, I mean, I have a lot of students that are out there that have become art teachers. Mm. I guess they saw that I was having so much fun <laughs> teaching and, and just my enthusiasm for the subject matter must have rolled off on them. Personally, in my experience, uh, my middle school art teacher was fresh out of college. Uh, the first year I was in middle school was her first year teaching. And I always attribute this to teachers like you who have a real passion and a real love for art on top of having a, a real passion and a love to educate the kids. And it's, it's individuals like you that, like you say, help young artists continue to prosper and, and grow and develop and even become art teachers themselves. Uh, and I always find that fascinating um, that you, you people like you give so much of your life and dedicate so much of your life yeah, definitely. to inspiring yeah. and, and helping others. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of time involved. And I've had a lot of great students over the years, you know, and the nice thing um, is that I've stayed in contact with a lot of them via Facebook and social media. And I have one student that is um, a product designer for Disney. So basically what he does is he draws the characters and he'll go around the world promoting Disney products or he'll have a, uh, a sit-in session someplace where he's just drawing the characters in front of a bunch of people. You know, and I have other, I don't know how many teachers, <laughs> art teachers that are out there that were uh, my students, but uh, a friend of mine in, a, in an adjacent uh, school district has three of my students. He was a, he's an art teacher. He's the head of the department, and he has <laughs> three of my students wow. <laughs> that are art teachers. <laughs> wow. I know, it's crazy. So here's a question that I like asking uh, people as well, um, especially individuals, well, I'm probably the last generation to actually remember 
a time where it was pre-internet, where there was right. no no internet, no Facebook, and Instagram and Snapchat and all this. Uh, do you feel that the advent and the popularity of the internet has helped or hindered creativity on a as a as a whole? It, sometimes it feels like that there's it's oversaturated in in a way. Um, and I just yeah, always like to hear other people's opinion. That's a good question. Um, I'm sort of, I don't want to say I'm on the fence about that. I think that the way things are today with social media and technology and so on, I think it, what it has done, it has opened the door for a lot of people to be more creative mm -hmm. and to make art in that type of a genre rather than having the skills of sitting down, drawing, painting, mixing colors, and so on. They do it on the computer. But I, as, always, as I always have told my students is that you better know how to draw and how to mix colors before you get into some of that so that you have a foundation. You need a foundation to grow on. You know, if you just start off, oh, I'm gonna be an abstract painter say, well, you better know the real world before you abstract from it. Mm. Wow, that's pretty deep. You know, so that was always my philosophy. And uh, I like to, to uh, encourage my students. That's the thing that I liked about teaching is I get this ninth grader who has abilities that don't, doesn't realize it. Mm. Just keep on encouraging them. You know, and by the time that they're seniors, they're like, wow. I don't think I could have drawn like that when I was a senior. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, all of my art teachers were, were very influential in my thinking, mm -hmm. all of them. I wanted to ask you also, like, why do you choose the medium that you work with? Uh, and, you know, the most prominent mediums, most artists have always ex uh, experimented with several different types of mediums right. until we find the ones that is right for us, you right. know what I'm saying? So. What, what made you choose your medium that you use now? That's a good question. Um, probably because it was easy in the beginning. I mean, I could just sit there with a sketchbook and draw. You know, or I'd copy stuff out of comic books and things like that when I was little. Um, and that just progressed and I started using inks and, and colored pencils and other types of things. And yeah, I did some oil paintings and I've done acrylic paintings. Um, Occasionally, I, I still play around with that stuff. But my main focus is on, on drawing and the drawing mediums that are out there. So mostly graphite, uh, colored pencil, ink, mixed media, watercolor. Uh, I kind of combine them all together. And it slowly has gone from just doing graphite works. When I first started getting into galleries in New York, that's mostly what I was doing was just black and white graphite drawings. And then I slowly decided that all right, it needs more. And then I slowly started working a little bit of color into these works. And then before I knew it, I was like, all right, I'm gonna just do an entire colored pencil piece without anything else. And that got the ball rolling. And as you can see, this is, <laughs> this is what I do. Yes. <laughs> and your, your work is uh, very, very photorealistic. I mean, just the immense attention that you pay to the detail is almost mind-boggling. And uh, so what, what makes you uh, do that as well, to take that extra time and an extra effort to produce a almost photorealistic piece of art? I think what it was was back in the... Let me think, when was it? When I first encountered the photorealists, I was just, you know, it's that skill um, that the illustrators had, you know, the whole Norman Rockwell, how he got everything so perfect, you know, and, and still kept it light, but, you know, it was just incredible, and I just have stayed with that in my own work. I like things that are real. I like to, to show the world what I'm thinking and how I perceive the world. Um, the piece that's here is just from a still life uh, piece that I had created that was uh, basically in homage to my father who was a World War II vet. Okay, so well, let's, let's break down some of the imagery and, and some of the concepts that you 
have uh, so painstakingly <laughs> put into this piece here and try to analyze it a little bit. So from the the shattering of the house, even before the house is shattered, it looks like it's been burnt and and smashed. And it, it seems reminiscent of uh, warfare almost to an extent. Well, as I said, it was a homage to my to my father and he was in World War Two and I created a series which is ongoing of, of works that are in the same kind of concept where I'll take a building that I have sat down and actually made out of mat boards and whatever other supplies I had. Then I'd take it to someplace safe. So you actually built the arrangement uh, yeah. yourself? <clears throat> this, is actu this is actually a setup. Okay. So this, I actually was just sitting down drawing from this. Drawing from life. From drawing, life. Draw, yeah, exactly. That's amazing. And that's, that's what I was doing. In fact, that's my dad's hammer. Wow, <laughs> that is amazing. And, you know, whatever would work, and I would burn things, just not because I'm a pyromaniac, by, but it was fun <laughs> <laughs> on a small scale. And, and, and in doing so, I have gained a, a, a greater respect for firemen. Okay. Because putting it out was like, well, that's still burning. <laughs> so, and then I would very, very carefully put, bring that up to my studio and have this whole thing set up. And it would take me a couple of weeks sometimes to, to create the still life that I wanted to work from. Uh, like, like this little guy back here, he's, uh, he's a little plastic, you know, baby toy that goes in the, in the tub that I transformed into a little... <laughs> Um, Looks like a, a, of yeah, war. a tank, almost, with the wheels coming out right. and the guns coming out of the front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other random, random things, you know. And as you were mentioning before about surrealism, yeah, Dolly was always an influence on me, nice. you know. So I went, I went from <laughs> Norman Rockwell to Dolly <laughs> and, and Magritte, you know, because they had these... Well, not so much Dolly, but Magritte had these subtleties that I just really, really liked. Yeah. And my work isn't always just like this, where I work from life itself. I'll, I'll venture off and, and work from things out of my head or just reference materials, or I'll come up with a concept in my, in my head, and it's like, all right, how am I going to portray this on, on paper? Yeah, that thing, it, trying to transform a concept into a a visual representation that the viewer exactly. can actually understand is, is probably one of the most challenging things about being a visual artist. Right. Um, a friend of mine called me up oh, a couple of years ago and says, I got an idea for you. I got an idea. It's like, okay, what, what's that? Well, I just heard that these sea turtles, or this sea turtle was attacked by a shark when it was young and they were making prosthetic flippers for it. Hmm. And I thought you could do something with that. And I thought, yeah, and I, that just festered in me for the, for the longest time, and I kept thinking, what can I do with it? So rather than putting regular flippers on it, <laughs> I put World War II airplane wings and motors. <laughs> <laughs> That's something interesting. Something a little bit different. Yeah, something you know, a little and, different. You know, and as a scuba diver, which I am, you know, I work from some of my photographs that I've taken underwater, and, and I would just create this image uh, of the sea turtles with airplane wings. Wow. I know. It's, I don't have that piece with me. I'm sorry. No, let's, uh, let's examine some more of your work. Okay. <clears throat> this is interesting. This is my most recent piece. Oh, okay. I just I just finished that well a couple of weeks back. It's time consuming. And and once again, your details are just absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, thank the you. The folds in the fabric, the the lighting, the the transparency of the of the plastic is just it's, it's all there. It's sitting right in front of you so that when you want to try to understand better how that looks, just focus on that, break it down into small pieces, 
and just see how the values and the light affects it, the changes, and so on. That's fantastic. The nice thing is that you can't sit here, look at this, and compare it to the <laughs> to the, the real yeah. to the real setup that it, that I was working from. So if I make errors or it's not exactly like the setup, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Because you're looking just at this and you don't compare it to the others. And I usually just destroy the setup after I'm done. Well, you, your pieces are, are really eclectic in a way, um, ranging from the different materials, the different textures and everything, and, and especially the imagery itself of having, it, it's, once again, it, it's, it's several different concepts that you can kind of glean from this, uh, kind of like water and ocean pollution. Uh, exactly. Animals dying off. Well, you know, as a diver, I've seen what, what man has done to our reefs and, and so on through uh, global warming. It's, it is. It's very tragic and it's upsetting. Yeah. You know, I was just down in Curacao uh, this past February and saw a lot of dead coral. You know, it's and the and the uh, the variety of fish that I normally see when I'm down in the Caribbean, you know, I didn't see as much in Curacao. And that's just in a, what, a span of a few years? Well, I haven't been there before, but yeah, well, I'd say over the last, I don't know, 20? Yeah, two decades? Yeah. That's not a long time. No. So can, can you walk us through the uh, construction of this setup and what, what uh, makes you finalize what pieces that you're going to actually display in your, in your diorama? Well, I actually have had the the six pack holder for for a long time and I had a number of different ideas that I wanted to, to either do with an assemblage or something that makes a statement about what it is. So I decided this time around uh, I just used some stone mainly because it's sort of like a barren reef. Um, I used paper for for like the sponges because it's sort of representative without actually having a sponge. Uh, or coral. Uh, the manatee, manatees are always endangered. Uh, cloth has always been sort of a, I don't want to say it's easy for me, but I've, it's easier than some things. And I try not to limit myself into what I do so that it, there's a lot of constant repeat. But, uh, so I have paper in the background and the paper itself was, was sprayed red, but I changed it as I go along. So this is called Tide. And so it was inspired by the red tide, was really what it was. And, and I put just the photograph here of nice blue water. Like it's almost Aquable. just a memory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Someone said, is that a television screen? <laughs> That's, that's another fantastic piece. Do you have anything else we can see? This is also fairly recent. Just once again, the details. You can see that it's cardboard and even the, the inner layers of the cardboard there. I know, I'm very uh, precise. I make sure I measure everything. It looks like a... <laughs> Looks like a Hollywood set almost. Yeah. This is this is interesting. The pipeline, uh, the falling, <laughs> the falling lights. So, once again, uh, walk us through some of the, the conceptual images here. Um, my wife Nikki Moser had given me these uh, cardboard cutouts, which I, I oh, the piece I'm working on presently, I used them again. <clears throat> Um, and I thought, what can I do? And it, you know, and and living up in Northeast Pennsylvania with pipelines and fracking and everything else, um, it just—it's like I hate to see the landscape being broken up, you know. So you see a nice, wonderful mountain, and all of a sudden, pfft, it's cut out, you know. Which is also another piece that's eventually going to come, come out of me, you know. Just, just subtle in the background, but uh, in fact, I reused this, this pipeline on the drawing that I'm working on now. 
And all that is is just um, uh, cardboard tubes that I picked up from uh, aluminum foil. And then, and then these things are stuff that I find. And then I'll, then I'll cut and make it and put it together. I mean, even, even your, your, your set designs are so well put together. Like you're, you're so talented in so many different ways to <laughs> even be able to, to assemble these. So you said the last piece had fabric and paper. This almost looks like crumpled paper in the background that's to represent the, the mountains and the hills. Right. And that's, and that's basically what it is. And the, and the mountains in the background are the, are the cardboard. I wanted to bring a touch of of the outdoors mm -hmm. inside. And that's, I didn't do that on the, the last two pieces, but um, I do that occasionally, where I will put a background that's not part of the setup, but it becomes part of the overall concept exactly. of, the, of the work itself. And it's, it's a, it gives that, that stark contrast between, I don't know, the the sky is, is lively and bright and, filled with energy and then exactly. in the front in the foreground you just have this bleak you know grungy <laughs> pipelines and oil like oil rigs and stuff and I don't know I really I really 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 just enjoy uh coming up with my own stories yeah yeah well art. you know it's that's what art is you know you come up with a story that that goes with it and and I've created some pieces over the years that people misunderstood what I was trying to do, but they came up with a story for it that they just loved. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I remember them asking me, well, what's the story behind this? And I said, well, I really don't always like to tell you what the story is, because it might ruin the concept for you. But I did, and then it totally blew it up. It's like, really? That's what it means? Yeah. Oh, I don't like it now. <laughs> yeah. So To each their own. Yeah, but I like the contrast between kind of like the drab and the blue sky. And that's the same piece with, with this one where I had the little photograph of, of the actual water that looks beautiful. And, and what's the title of this piece? Uh, this is called Prosperity. That's the title alone is, <laughs> is interesting. So, uh, any other works you can show us? The only other, other works that I have, I have two small prints. And so we have some more of your work here, and, and these appear to be etchings or prints? Um, I don't do very many prints. Um, I haven't done a, an etching since college days. And an etching, basically, you have a zinc plate that's covered with uh, sort of a waxy material. And you take a sharp tool, and you basically do an ink drawing. You just do a line drawing. So all of these lines were etched into that. And then you put it into an acid bath for X amount of minutes. So how deep you want your, your lines to be. And initially, I didn't have that in there. I just had this gargoyle. And this was ov obviously drawn from life. I have a gargoyle at home that looks just like that guy that I brought back from Notre Dame in Paris. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in a, involved in an art group that uh, we were doing a show that was using France and Paris as an influence. So I came up with a gargoyle, oh, wow. which made sense. <laughs> um, so I, would, I started doing the drawing, and, and a friend of mine who had uh, a studio, a print studio, uh, was of great help because I, believe me, my skills as a, as a, a printer needed to be updated. <laughs> considering the fact that I did it in college and I'm um, no longer in college. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then after I got done with that, then we masked off areas to do the aqua tint, which was basically this kind of grayish look that you see back here that's not the lines. Okay. And then after all of that is done, then you print, you, you wet the paper, you dry it just a little bit, so it's damp. You ink the plate, which is the time-consuming thing, because there's some some prints that, you know, I don't have this shoulder that white. It's a little bit darker. So not every print comes out exactly the same, because every time you have to re-ink it, and you have to rub it off, and, and so on. 
So it's 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 time consuming, but different than than my other drawings. Exactly, and that's something else too. Like I, I admire about artists who can use different mediums, different genres, and produce artwork that you would assume came from a completely different artist. You know, it, yeah. it does not look like uh, some of your more recognizable work, but it's it's fascinating in itself. And you say you actually own this gargoyle. Yeah, I do. It's stone? Uh, it's, you know, it's a repro. Oh, okay, okay. That, you know, it's like a souvenir when you go to Notre Dame, you okay. can buy some things. I'm sure you can buy them online now. I have a few of them. Interesting, interesting. Can you show us some more? This next one, is a dro is upside down. <laughs> is an is a, an etching, but it's a dry point, so it has no acid, acid bath. This was done uh, from a drawing that I had done a couple years ago, and what I did was I just took the drawing and laid a piece of plexiglass right over top of it and took an etcher's tool that has like a diamond point to it and just etched into the, pl the plexiglass. So that was- Kind of like, like essentially tracing your own drawing. Yeah, I was tracing my, I mean, I could have drawn directly onto the plastic without that, but I thought, well, I, I always, I liked this image. It was just sort of a fun image with all the different faces and, and so on that are in there. Uh, this is called the North Wind. In case you ever wanted to know where the north wind came from, <laughs> this is it. Came uh, from this been there. Tree. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was watching me work on this because I did this up at Marywood University. Oh, you did. Yeah, with people, with know. with Peter Hoffer, okay. who was was teaching, and uh, there wasn't a lot of people there, but I was just sitting there working, and uh, they were they were just watching, and it's like, and I every once in a while I'd go 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm counting the lines. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I used to do that to my students when I was teaching. Um, I'd be doing an ink drawing, and I'd be doing the same thing because they'd be amazed at what I'm doing. It's like, yeah, I have a little counter on the end of my pen that tells me how many <laughs> lines I've actually <laughs> drawn. <laughs> Trying to keep track <laughs> of these things. And the kid's like, wow, Mr. Huck. <laughs> I said, I'm kidding. It's not really <laughs> real. It's not real. No, so, and then, then I had to ink these, just the same process, you know, everyone had to be inked. And but without the acid bath. Without, without the acid okay. bath, and, and I, I used a, a water-based ink for this. But it's the same process, it has to go through, you know, you wet the paper, you dry it a little bit but so that it's just damp, and then you put it through a press. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's nice, I like the process. These, these images are, um, a real big contrast from some of your other work. Yeah. Uh, and that's, once again, I just find that absolutely amazing that the styles of uh, imagery that you can create uh, differ so much from each other's, especially the, the highly saturated colors in your color pencil drawings to these very minimalistic, yeah. basic, but very detailed images that you use for your prints. Well, I can, I can go in lots of different directions. Um, Francis Picabia, the uh, surrealist, uh, his, the quote that has always stayed with me is that my head is round so my thinking can change direction. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Kind of stuck with me. The, o the other quote that has always stayed with me was uh, a Dali quote that no masterpiece was ever created by a lazy artist. That is a good one too. Isn't that good? It is. Um, so I, I'm very, as I said, very detailed oriented. I like things that are precise. But when I was teaching, I had all this art materials here so I could just play. Mm. And I would, I would do some abstractions. I'd take a bunch of old paint at the end of the school year that had just like twos that were almost empty and I'd just squirt them onto this thing and I'd just take a piece of mat, a small piece of mat board and just squeegee it around to see what kind of things I would wow. get. Or I would take, um, bottle caps or buttons or other things and just sort of like stick them into the paint and then at the end of the, the summer when I go back everything is nice and dry I can go back and paint over top of it. So I have a number of pieces that are like that at home that are just not like this at all. You know it's fun to play. 
you know, and I, it, I'll do some sculptural things from time to time just because I like working with my hands. I should have brought one of my, my decoy ducks along. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been cool to look I know. at. Well, Richard, your, your work is truly phenomenal, and I've had a, a great time talking with you today. I really appreciate you uh, coming by and, and sharing your stuff with us. You're quite welcome. That's, you're easy to talk to. Much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I love your work, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. That's a huge compliment coming from you. Well, I appreciate that, too. I'm Travis Prince, and this has been another episode of Electric City's Television's Roundtable Discussions. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.